Uh, let me begin by thanking both uh, the MSH and ICSSR for doing me the honor of inviting me to participate in this seminar. Um, I'm sure there will be a great deal that I will take back from the seminar uh, and possibly um, later on work on. Um, I shall, because of the limitations of time, I shall be very drastic with my presentation. Unlike uh, Professor Singh, who just preceded me, I don't have the uh, facility to make a uh, presentation just from the notes. So I shall have to read little bits from my uh, paper, which is in front of you. Um, I don't think many of you might have had the chance of uh, uh, looking at it. Uh, but don't worry. Uh, what I shall do is I'll leave out a, an entire section, the, perhaps the largest section of uh, the paper. I shan't touch it at all, except maybe uh, point to the conclusions that I reach um, at the end of the third section. And then um, that shouldn't take more than 20 minutes. So. Um, first, I begin with a disclaimer. I'm not a social scientist. Uh, I do a little bit of philosophy, <laughs> but I, <laughs> I take an interest in the social sciences. So, um, well, it's, it's nice to get to be, to, to be, to get mistaken. <laughs> you have been heading the advanced Institute of Social Science. <laughs> social Science. Social Science is part of philosophy or philosophy is part of social science? Okay. okay. So what I shall do in this paper, is to explore the idea of a community, particularly, particularly in the context of India. I shall also say something about the role, if any, that the notion of allegiance to a community may play in a substantial, as opposed to a merely instrumental sense in an individual's identity. Now, the, the, the next bit is the bit that I'll leave out, but uh, uh, this is a bit about the concept of marginality and mar or marginalization, which uh, Professor Singh uh, uh, mentioned um, in a different way, has emerged as an important tool in the social science literature in our country for the understanding of our social, political, moral, and cultural predicaments. Then finally, I shall make a few remarks about the idea of development in the light of the foreground. You know, the liberal individualist versus the communitarian debate frames much of the recent moral political discourse in the West. Yet many of the inherent difficulties of spelling out the very concept of an individual or of a community have not been addressed with the kind of seriousness that they deserve. The difficulty of getting a hang of the idea of community is apparent from the fact that it can be used with much apparent use to designate a great variety of different entities. People belonging to a particular religion, or to a denomination, or a sect of a particular religion, a caste or a subcaste, a linguistically distinct group, a nation or a group of nations, e.g. the European community or the international community, a village or an urban collectivity, and so on. Obviously, a concept with as unwieldy an application as this cannot be the basis for any significant moral political debate. For the purposes of such a debate, some agreed boundary to the concept, however unstable and porous, must be drawn. In doing so, I take the help of two things. One, the notion of an ideology and that of language. The former as a useful metaphor and the latter more literally. An ideology, e.g. Marxism, liberalism, and so on, is a network of ideas, a web, as it were, of ideas, related to one another in a complex variety of ways, providing a more or less unified perspective on the world, its rights and wrongs, fairs and fouls, truths and falsehoods. A credible, vibrant ideology also provides the possibility of an internal critique, possibility too of taking, an external, uh, taking on external adversaries as well as creative, transformative conversation with them, as indeed also with sympathizers, a kind of open-endedness. It seems to me that a community, in the sense in which it can usefully feature in a moral political debate, 
ought to have exactly the kinds of characteristics that I said were specific to an ideology. A community is a group of people bound together in a network of organic relationships, providing a more or less unified perspective on the world, with its own sense of good and bad, fair and foul, true and false, deeply embedded in it. Such a network must also have an inner assurance of stability, which is provided by its tradition, its memories, its past. A vibrant community also includes an argument about itself, a possibility of transformative conversation with itself. It is therefore also open-ended. Of course, there are communities which are not open-ended in the sense, but such communities, and this is my view, tend to become parasitic upon themselves. They are potentially self-destructive. A community such as this constitutes, to my mind, a culture. Another way of elucidating my notion of a community and a culture is through the idea of language. That is a native, natural, given language. This I do in a somewhat more concrete way by taking examples from the part of my country from where I come. That is, it's northeast. But first, a few remarks about language as such. Language, as St. Augustine said a long time ago, lights up the world for us. It enables us to individuate things in it, to probe their differences, to distinguish between its rights and wrongs, true and false, and so on. And very importantly, each language lights up the world in its own distinct way. Language is the paradigmatic repository of meanings. It is meanings that breathe life into language, else we only have just acoustic blasts coming out of humans' mouths, or meaningless marks on paper or whatever. And it is human actions and therefore human relationships that generate meanings for language. The organic relationships that I mentioned a little earlier on are relationships which constitute and are constituted by meanings. To take example, to take simple examples, think of the idea of father, mother, home, friend, play, forest, wilderness, crop, food, promise, insult, honor, and so on. It is human relationships, different uh, relationships of different kinds that give them meanings, and it is by exploring those meanings that we can probe the nature and depths of these relationships. Perhaps this is what is meant by the so-called hermeneutic circle. Language must therefore be very intimately linked with the individuation of a community or a culture. But language is, of course, not the sole repository of meanings. Almost anything that plays a role in a community's perspective on the world that it inhabits is pregnant with meaning. Sun, moon, stars, rivers, forests, trees, forest paths, artifacts of different kinds, houses, ponds, birds, insects, animals. Name anything and it has a meaning or rather a variety of meanings. What might, however, be said with some justification is that language is, as it were, the basic text of a culture. All other things are certainly part of this text, but in a somewhat secondary way. To put it in another way, it is because we are primarily language-building creatures that things in the world, other, and things in the world other than language can also have meanings. Given that there's a vital connection between language and culture, I would like to say something about this connection in the context of the northeast of our country. To much of the world, and even of India, the northeast conjures up the idea of a region which is more or less unitary, culturally, quote unquote, racially, and linguistically. It grows tea and rice, its forests are home to a great variety of wildlife, and some of its people are, again, quote unquote, primitive and ferocious. Many bureaucrats treat a posting in the Northeast as a kind of punishment posting. This idea of a unitary Northeast is now, of course, being gradually replaced by a more realistic notion of its variety of cultures, languages, histories, traditions of governance. How is this variety to be understood? In other words, how is one to individuate language? Is the Bengali spoken in the Kachar district of Assam the same language as the one spoken in Kolkata? Or is the Assam spoken in parts of Lower Assam the same language as the one spoken in Upper Assam? The important point to realize, however, is that on one kind of count, 
there might be about 50 languages spoken in the Northeast, and on another kind of count, there might be close to 100. Considering the intimate connections between a language and a form of life or a culture, this is an extraordinarily interesting point. If one is talking about the culture of Northeast India or even the cultures of Northeast India, language lights up the world for us, and different languages light up the world for us in different ways. But while obviously there is truth in this, it cannot possibly be claimed as a truth with rigid boundaries. Else, we'd have had a Northeast with a myriad visions of the world, each enclosed within the, limit, within the limits to which its own light reaches. Of course, it is through language that the human infant gets gradually inducted into the life of the community, its rights and wrongs, good and bad, fair and foul, and yes, it's true and false. But the important point is that a language, while it is in a certain important sense complete in itself, its boundaries are never precise. They frequently merge into the boundaries of another language, and conversations between them are not only possible, but have frequently taken place. And such conversations have made, in many cases, a great deal of difference to each other. About the languages in the Northeast, I'd like to say the following. One, each of them is complete in itself in the sense that everything that can be said in it can be said with clarity and precision. It is never the case that what can be said in it can be said better in another language, that it is an inferior version of another language. Two, but many things cannot be said in a particular language. To take an extreme example, the language of theoretical physics cannot be a part of conversational kasi. In such cases, borrowings from another language have to take place. The history of language is replete with such borrowings. Three, in the Northeast, languages live so close to each other that in many cases, one gets inducted into the life of the community, not just through one language, but several languages. So th they grow up as naturally multilingual beings. Four, multilingualism within a community is therefore a perfectly natural phenomenon. In switching from one language to another and mixing up, mixing, up, mixing up different languages in one's natural conversation, one doesn't move from one vision of the world to another in a kind of schizophrenic frenzy, but one is, as it were, a native citizen of a multivisionary world. One of the ways in which North, the Northeast has been profoundly misunderstood by the rest of the country, and even by people whose home is the Northeast, is by ignoring this fact about the Northeast. Most people in the Northeast live in multivisionary worlds. And while a particular community may be firmly established in whatever might be the core of its vision, always a difficult thing to articulate, even when we live by it, there is, even in it, a substantial but wholly natural appropriation of elements of other visions. One cannot, for instance, think of the Assamese culture except in this light. Now I'm perhaps in a position to say something a little more definite about the relationship between culture and meanings. And I say this in terms of the following points. One, every culture, insofar as it is a distinctly identifiable culture at all, manifests its distinctness in the web of meanings which informs its distinct mode of life. Two, meanings are never constant, nor are they unitary or singular. They change with time, and they may be different from one context to another. Three, don't believe in theories which say that it is just one thing or another in human nature which is the source of the urge to surround ourselves with meanings. Theories such as the ones which give pride of place to the sex urge or to power. You know the kinds of people I'm talking about, Freud, Foucault, and so on. For yet since there is a natural history of humans, just as there is a natural history of animals, humans across cultures and communities share many things, including meanings in common. In five, there are connectivities of multifarious kinds between webs of meanings that constitute different cultures. These connectivities are frequently mutually enriching. But let me here make some necessary qualifications. The domain of meanings that is a culture is not an enclosed domain. Just as the variety of meanings that, would, that a word might have is not, a, is, not, is not predetermined. Different domains of meanings frequently meet and make more or less subtle differences to each other. This has happened 
throughout the history of mankind, it has of course also happened that one domain has overpowered, completely distorted, appropriated, or even brought about the extinction of another domain. Here I think of some of our tribal cultures and on a broader canvas, the relationship between the so-called global culture of quote-unquote freedom, quote-unquote individual liberty, quote-unquote universal human values, and local cultures such as that of the Red Indians and the wonderfully variegated complex of cultures of our own country. In our own country, the domains of meanings have, during the course of history, interacted with each other, conversed with each other, and made surprising and creative differences to each other. It is for this reason that it is not unreasonable at all to suggest that these domains form a, fo form a family of their own with family resemblances crisscrossing in innumerable and complex variety of ways. Let me hazard the suggestion that our strength, I don't mean physical strength, but moral and spiritual strength, lies in just being such a family. Any attempt to shrink this family by herding its members into a single unitary domain is an attempt to enfeeble us, to make to strike at the very roots of a moral and spiritual life. Now briefly, uh, what then about the value of allegiance to a culture, to a community in my sense? Frequently, we specify our identities in terms of the overriding character of such a value. That is, in conceiving our identity, we allow the value of such allegiance to override all other values. While a liberal individualist might claim that this is a grave mistake, both of moral evaluation and of knowledge, I do believe that there is such a thing as the good of the community or culture, and that one's integrity as a person may frequently be constituted by an overriding allegiance to the community. Suppose I ask myself the question, who am I, and answer it by saying, I am a Miri, Miri is the name of a tribe, a tribesman above all ends. This means that my being a Miri tribesman defines me in a way which no other description of me can. Descriptions such as, I am a teacher, a tennis player, an occasional writer of philosophical articles, and so on. To be deprived of this identity, that is the Miri identity, is for my being, my human being, to be eroded in a way profoundly different from the way in which the non-availability of any of the other descriptions might possibly erode my identity. This is, of course, not to say that one's identity cannot be articulated in terms of a very different ordering of values. It certainly can and frequently is. All I would like to say is that allegiance to a culture can be, as well as, uh, can be, as we all know, a very powerful force, and this has, in our country, as in many others, led to intractable moral and political predicaments. These predicaments are compounded by the fact that it is never easy to articulate with any degree of clarity and authenticity once what one might call core identity. Many people would, of course, deny that there is such a thing at all. I do not agree with them, but this is not the place for me to go into details about this. This is true also when I claim, th also when I claim that the core of my identity is my allegiance to my community or culture. Very often, emotions big cloud any possibility of clarity and authenticity. When this happens, my cultural identity becomes an instrumentality, which may have little to do with a genuine allegiance. It becomes a tool to be used for purposes more or less external to it. My guess is that the more external the purpose, the more likelihood of its being associated with violence and coercion. My guess is also that the greater the depth and authenticity of my articulation of my allegiance to my culture, the more likely it is for me to come up against difficulties which are not easy to surmount, against what I have called the argument about itself that the culture must contain. It is in situations of this kind that communications of the kind that I have described above between domains of meanings may lead both to greater clarity and to a sense of emancipation. So I leave out section three altogether. That I, if you have the paper before you, I turn to page 17, where I just, uh, 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 let's the well, not the tentative kind of conclusions I reach at the end of the uh, third section. And this is number one, diversity does not, as I have tried to suggest at various points, imply mutual exclusion. This point I made already. Our cultural boundaries are fluid and messy. There are inevitably large similarities between our cultures, similarities 
in what might be called their cores and their peripheries. These similarities are partly the result of the fact that we are one mankind just as there is one animal kind. We must remind ourselves that we have a natural history just as animals do and that to a large extent we share with animals their natural history. Similarities also result from the fact that conversations primarily at a non-theoretical, intuitive level have always taken place among our cultures. Such conversations open up new bridgeheads between cultures. The plurality of our cultures has undoubtedly frequently generated mistrust, suspicion, conflict, and violence. But it is also largely true to say that there is a powerful, if somewhat inarticulate, sense of Indianness, which is what forms the basis of emotions such as pride, shame, love, joy, sadness, hope, which Indians feel when they think of their country. Then the sense of belonging, this sense of belonging is a contemporary articulation, Professor, uh, uh, Professor Singh uh, talked about the constitutional discourse. I'm not <laughs> very sure about this. But this sense of belonging needs a contemporary articulation, which it was hoped the secular republican discourse will provide. But so far, in spite of subtle nuances and variations within, the dis within that discourse, we cannot really say that it has provided a kind of articulation which is both adequate and which answers to the larger sense of belonging that I've just referred to. Let me, at the end, say something about development. Imagine the following situation. India has become fully, quote unquote, developed nation. And that this means that economic affluence has reached most sections of the people and is continuously on the increase. There is a thriving, strident, and diverse economic life in the country. This means a fluidity and mobility in the lives of people in the country, which is completely unprecedented. Instant, intelligent, and standardized communication is an absolute necessity for such fluidity or, and mobility to be possible. Since such development is inevitably linked with what goes on in the world outside, deep continuities emerge between India and other nations in most spheres of life. To remain established in the life of development, we shall need to have continuous technological innovations which will require the coming together of a great variety of activities committed in a naturally piecemeal way to such innovations. Imagine also that such a developed India is infused with a great sense of national pride and is militarily powerful to blunt any aggressive intentions of other nations. Such an India is, I think, the dream of the growth people of our country. This India of our imagination will naturally evolve, for instance, linguistic diversity, which makes instant, universally intelligible communication difficult. It will be wary of deep-rooted cultural idiosyncrasies and allegiances, which stand in the way of continuous growth. Cultural diversity may still continue, but it will either be detached from the basic fluid social structure, which has made the growth possible, or will be an artifact of growth itself. That is, it will have its life in a sphere which has little to do with life as it is lived palpably on the ground, e.g. the sphere of the media, entertainment industry, fashion, and so on. Cultural diversity will not thus be a threat to the unity of the nation. We might, in a way, have embarked upon such a part of development, but whether we shall ever achieve an India of the imagination that I've just described, deliberate, just described is doubtful in the extreme. And whether we ought to be Indians of such an India is a question that we should ask with much greater seriousness than we have ever asked before. But perhaps my skepticism about the future reality of an India of the imagination that I've just sketched is just wishful thinking. The growth scenario is perhaps the reality of future India. If so, we shall then have a national culture based on anonymity, digitally unitary communication, perpetual innovations, technological and otherwise, religion, community, culture, transcending material interests. Of the great family of cultures that is now India and, a natural sp and the moral spiritual life that is embedded in it, we shall then at best have a simulacra. Thank you very much.